Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Welcome here to Red Mountain Church. Uh, my name is Matt Clegg. I'm one of the pastors here, along with Charles Johnson here in the front row. Uh, if we've not met you before, uh, we'd really like to do that. Uh, please come up and say hi, uh, for you need no other reason other than to just uh, introduce yourself. We would love that. Um, feel free to make yourselves comfortable. I know we've got a few coming in from our adult ed class, which I held over very long today. I apologize about that. Um, but we've got coffee over here, free stuff over there. Uh, we've got uh, worship folders that'll have everything you'll need for worship this morning. And if you'll look in the back, um, we have a section of announcements. And speaking of adult ed, uh, we will not have a 9 a.m. discipleship hour the next two weeks. Um, that'll be Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, so we're going to take a break, and then we will resume for uh, four weeks in April, and we'll look forward to seeing you there um, at that time. Uh, please take note of our um, Holy Week activities coming up. Um, take note of the Sunday procession for children on Palm Sunday. Um, instructions are in here our Good Friday service on March 29th, and then our Easter brunch um, that is coming up. Um, that's a really fun time we have as a community to spend time together and celebrate the resurrection. So I hope to see you all there. Um, I'll leave the rest of this for you to read. Uh, please read the Around Town section for uh, other events going on around town. Uh, we're also going to do a uh, March Madness bracket coming up. Uh, you'll see details about that very shortly, probably tomorrow. Um, all right, let's flip back to the front of the worship folder and we will move into worship. Our call is to worship from Psalm 92 here in just a second, uh, but I wanna put them before you as words to reflect on, to uh, prepare to come before the Lord and to meet him. Um, and to do that, we're gonna take a moment of silence as we do every time, um, just for us to take a minute to be calm um, from all the moving around and um, hectic nature of a Sunday morning that it takes us to come into this place. Um, this is just to help us remember who we are and what we're doing here and who it is we're coming before. So let's take just a moment to be quiet and reflect on these words from Psalm 92 for just a second. Let me invite us all to stand together. And please join with me in the bold printed text. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made us glad by your work at the work of your hands. We sing for joy. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, we pray that you would meet us here this morning and you would alive in our hearts that we might hear and taste and see the good news that you have given us in Jesus. Uh, all the things that have been prepared, uh, would you work through them and would you help us by them that we truly might um, notice the works of your hands and we might be moved to sing for joy. Uh, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing and sing together.
be seated. The scripture reading for this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. This is God's word. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old receive their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and with Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she had considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand together and sing.
pretty confident. Now is the time in our service when we confess our sins, so please join me in the bold. Oh Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our sorrows. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear and forgive. And now hear these uh, words of grace. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Let's stand together and sing. One can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. One can make me whole again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the
Amen. Let's remain standing and confess our common faith together that we share with all believers throughout all times and all places. We'll use the Nicene Creed and just take note, it'll continue on the back of the page. Please join with me. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, he proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We're now going to move into a time of prayer, of thanksgiving and petition, and we'll be led into it by the Lord's Prayer, which we will sing, and then Kevin Cordell, one of our elders, will come and uh, offer further prayers, and we'll focus on the conclusion that it is God's who is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So let's sing together. Our Father. Continue praying with me. Father, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, a kingdom that cannot be shaken from everlasting to everlasting, a kingdom without end, a kingdom full of joy, of happiness, a kingdom of satisfaction, of pleasure, a kingdom of beauty, a kingdom of wonder, a kingdom of glory because you are there. Father, we confess we are trying to build our own kingdoms and we are disappointed and discouraged when they don't work out. They don't satisfy us. They come up short again and again. Would you help us to keep our eyes fixed on your kingdom that is coming, that you are going to rule and reign, that you are going to wipe away every tear, all of our sorrows, all of our fears, all of our doubts. Would you help us to endure the sorrow and the suffering as we wait for this kingdom to come and it's all of its realization for Christ to sit on that throne for all of eternity. Oh Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come in this church. We pray for our leadership, particularly those who are leading and hosting community groups, that your kingdom would come in the ways we love one another, 
serve one another, sit and talk about joys and sorrows with one another. But Lord, we pray for those who may not be connected, that they would find an avenue of friendship, an avenue of love and compassion uh, through these groups. Lord, we also pray that your kingdom would come at the Love Lady Center. We thank you for this ministry that we have also partnered with. Lord, would you provide all of the resources, both financial, the energy, the people, the volunteers, um, to help love and serve the downtrodden and the broken here in the city of Birmingham through this ministry. Father, we pray that your kingdom would come at our sister, our sister church, Oak Mountain Prez, as they have a new pastor, uh, that he would be grafted into the community, that you would uh, give great patience and endurance with a, a congregation who uh, longs to know this new pastor. Um, Father, we know that uh, those transitions can be uh, take a lot of time, and we just pray for flourishing of that church. Lord, as we wait for your kingdom to come, would you give us endurance, hope, and joy? And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Our children can be dismissed to teach me to worship. Please direct them to those double doors. We're trying to get in the habit of not going out the doors that I'm watching kids go through right now. So <laughs> send them this way. We want to keep them all moving in the same direction. Thanks. Um, also, um, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. I, I know that uh, I broke the rules, and I'm not wearing any green today, and I just want all the kids to know that I've been pinched several times already this morning. <laughs> And so that's done. That can be done. All right. So just begging for grace. <laughs> okay. Uh, over the last several weeks, we've looked at uh, an ongoing conversation. We spent three weeks on this, an ongoing conversation between Moses and God at the burning bush. And God is giving Moses a call. He, he's undeniably clear about what he wants Moses to do. Go to Egypt and rescue my people and bring them back. And, uh, and Moses is forced to remember all the reasons that he does not want to go back to Egypt. Uh, he's wanted for murder. Uh, he is uh, despised by the Egyptians. He at least feels that he is despised by his own people. And really, the ball's in his court. The conversation ended really abruptly, and the ball's in his court. And we're asking the question as we lean into this passage, we're asking the question, will he or won't he? How will, how will Moses respond to this call that God has put on his life? That's where we pick up. Let's look Exodus chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 18. I'll read through the end of the chapter, verse 31. Hear the word of the Lord. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. And then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak, and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. And then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed 
And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Uh, oh Lord, these people, when they heard uh, of your um, persevering and eternal care for them, they bowed their heads and worshiped. They believed. And I pray you would accomplish a similar work among us, that you would help us to hear uh, of your ongoing and eternal care for us. Uh, I pray you would build us in faith uh, and that you would help us to hear what you would have us hear and that you would help me to speak in a way that's helpful for your people, um, that you would give me words and thoughts organized in such a way that, that serves uh, us all well and honors you, our God and Father. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So it has to be a clear day, and you need to have good, capable eyes. But there are places where if you stand along the Southern California coastline, where you can look out to the, to the west, southwest, and you can make out the outline of Catalina Island, which is about 26 miles away. Uh, July 4th, 1952 was not such a day. In fact, it happens often there that the, the cool water in the Pacific Ocean can meet the warm air and enrolls a fog that can last all day. And that's what Florence Chadwick, uh, 34 years old at the time, was staring at as she was about to push off and try to swim all 26 miles uh, from the coastline all the way out to Catalina Island. Uh, of course, she wasn't alone when she was going to do this. She had uh, people in support boats. Her own mother was in one of those boats that were going along with her. And uh, they carried with them rifles to scare away sharks if sharks came around. And, uh, and they were there to help her if she got into any trouble. And, uh, and just so you know who we're talking about here, uh, this woman had already done the Straits of Gibraltar twice. Uh, she swam the English Channel. In fact, she broke the record for swimming across the English Channel. And, uh, and when she did, she got out and she told the press that she felt really good. And that was, she, she felt like she could just hop back in and go, go back to the other side. And, uh, and so she was, she was a woman with a lot of pluck who had done these kinds of things before. But this time it was different. She said the fog had got to her. That the fog was so disorienting and so confusing. And there were times when she was in the water where she could hear the boats were close and that the people were talking, she could hear them. But she couldn't see them. And they couldn't see her. And she swam for 15 hours before she finally called her mother and said, I don't know if I can go any further. And her mother said, you, got, you have more to give keep going. And she swam for almost another hour, 15 hours and 55 minutes before she called her mother up and said, hey, come get me. You got to get me out of here. I can't keep going anymore. And uh, it wasn't until she got into the boat and they made their way that they realized that they were only about a half mile away from the shoreline. She said it was the fog. It was the fog that got her, the disorientation of the fog. Uh, I bring that up because I think what we're looking for here, what we're looking at here in this passage is Moses is about to make a journey. In fact, he's setting off on a, on a very hard and taxing journey, and I think we actually see a lot of fog in this passage. We see the fog of unbelief. Is God really going to do what he says he will do? Uh, we see the fog of inadequacy. Am I the guy that is the right person that you have chosen for this task? And uh, I think you see the fog of doubt or skepticism. Is there any way this story could go well? There's a lot of fog in this passage. And I think what we're going to see is that God's grace works powerfully in the middle of all those gray areas of fog that can be disorienting. Those are the precise places where Moses, who is acting in faith and moving forward in faith, meets God's grace in profound ways operating on his life. 
And so here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how Moses acts in faith, uh, how Moses is protected by faith, and finally, how he is encouraged in faith, okay? Acted in faith, protected by faith, and encouraged in faith. Acting in faith. First, we see Moses acting in faith, and, uh, uh, and he does this with limited instruction, and he does it with limited confidence, okay? So acting in faith, he's, he's made a decision that he is going to obey God. Uh, if you look in this passage, you will see that the word go... I tried to emphasize it when I was reading it so you would catch it as it was coming through. That word go or to go or even went is used eight to ten times, but depending on how you count it. And each time it is either used in reference to someone obeying God's commands uh, or disobeying God's commands. God tells, um, God tells Moses to go, go to Egypt and rescue my people. Moses goes to Jethro and says, please let me go. And Jethro tells Moses, go in peace. You see the theme here? When God goes to Aaron, he says, go into the wilderness to meet Aaron. And each time it's this command that, uh, that, that God is giving Moses, and it's Moses and Aaron's decision to obey them. The, the stark contrast is Pharaoh in this passage. He's, it says he will not let these people go. And so the important point that's being driven here is that Moses has decided to go. He's made a decision to obey. And what's interesting to me about this is that he's made this decision to obey with limited instruction. Now, it's entirely possible when we read narratives like this that there is more to the conversation between God and Moses than was recorded in Exodus. There could, there could have been a lot more back and forth than we see here. That's possible. But what's interesting to me is that it at least appears that while Moses and God are going back and forth on the big questions about how this should go, uh, there are still lots of small questions that, uh, and very important natural questions that Moses would ask. I mean, think about, just put yourself in Moses' shoes and think about, um, think about this decision to go and ha like all the things you're going to need if you're going to go back into Egypt. Like, even, like what am I going to eat? Who, how am I going to be provided for? Uh, I'm going back into Egypt. How, Israel is a, 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 now a nation of uh, just a tremendous number of people. And how am I going to gather them all up and talk to them? How's that going to happen? Uh, and then once I do, if that goes as you say it will, then how am I going to turn around and even like go get company with Pharaoh? How is that going to work out? Like, I don't understand. Like, all of these questions that Moses would have asked are not being answered here. He's just simply taking the next step that God has given to him. He's going with a lot of questions and uh, with limited instruction. And he's going with limited confidence. And you see this, I think, you see this in verse 18. When he goes to Jethro, uh, he lies to Jethro about what he's doing. Did you see that? In verse 18, uh, he says, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. Now, you all know what this feels like, right? When you're having a conversation with somebody and, uh, and you know there is more behind what's going on than what they're telling you. Like, I, I can still see the look on my parents' face sometimes in conversations where they just, like my dad raised his eyebrows and he just knew that, uh, that there's more truth to be told here. I wonder if Jethro was suspicious that there is more behind what, why Moses was asking uh, for his blessing to go. And some people would say that it's possible that Moses just thinks that the story of him uh, meeting God and talking to him through a burning bush is just not plausible. I mean, there, like, how could Jethro have, uh, have understood and agreed to allow his daughter and his grandkids to go with Moses back to Egypt after hearing a story like that? Is that even possible? 
But it doesn't really square with what we know of Jethro. Jethro is the priest of Midian by Exodus chapter 18. You're gonna, we're going to see that he, he uh, exhibits some pretty astounding theological insight and, uh, and just real world wisdom. And uh, he might be like the one person who would have understood. But I think at the very least, what you see behind these words that, that Moses uh, gives to Jethro is just a, a, a still remaining reluctance to embrace with confidence exactly, that this is going to go exactly the way God says it would. And guess what you're seeing? You're seeing Moses made the right decision to obey God. But he's doing it despite real limited instruction. His knowledge isn't full and limited confidence. His heart isn't quite full as he looks at these things. And I think it's important that we see this. I think it's important that when we look at Moses, we're we're seeing somebody who's wrestling through what it looks like to obey God, even and especially during times when he doesn't understand God. And it's important that we see him go and carrying a backpack full of questions and concerns and misgivings about what might happen uh, along the way. Because this story of the Exodus is really about God's faithfulness. It's less about Moses' faithfulness. But it's about God's faithfulness, but both to the people of God and to the person of Moses himself. Because for whatever reason, God chose Moses for this task. And God has committed to providing for him and protecting him along the way. And what Moses is going to have to do, and you'll see this as we keep going, you'll see this. Moses is going to learn along the way with each step he takes of just the the creative and unbelievable ways that God provides for him. And I give this point to you because I know that I am speaking to a room full of people asking questions. Good questions. Important questions. Questions like, why did you put this into my life? Or why did you allow this to happen? Or how is this going to go? I would say those are good questions. And I would encourage question asking. I would. I would even say those are faithful questions. And they're faithful because you are faithfully directing those questions to the only one that really has an answer for them. But I'll also say that God, God, one of the things this story tells us is that God doesn't always greet our questions with quick answers. But he does something better. What he does is he answers our questions by giving us himself. There is nowhere Moses will go where God is not with him. And what he will see is that help comes to Moses from some of the most unpredictable places. And this is where we see that he is protected by faith. Now, let me ask you, when I read verses 24 through 26, you can look at it again now if, it, if you don't know which verse. When I read those verses, were you a little confused about what is going on here? I had a conversation before our session meeting. I sat, we had some elders, shepherdesses, a deacon was with us. It was a great dinner that we had together before our, our meetings. And, uh, and we were talking about this story, and one of our elders said, this has got to be top five in the list of the most confusing stories in the entire Bible. Uh, what in the world is going on in this story? Uh, it, one of the reasons is confusing to us is because there's just a lot going on in this passage that we just won't ever know about, like we won't ever understand. I've wondered what the first readers of these words might have understood that we don't, but, uh, but that's true, okay? One of the other reasons that this story is confusing to us is it feels like it just comes out of nowhere. Uh, like if you lift, it's the dissonance of it all. If you lifted these verses out of, the, of the, the overall story, it wouldn't change your trajectory at all. So why did Moses, who wrote Exodus to give it to God's people, why did Moses include this scary story of what happened? Well, one of the things that Moses wants us to know and that God is teaching us is that 
Moses was also disobedient. Uh, even in the acts, act, like the overarching act of Moses' obedience for God, he has also been engaging this entire time in a, lar- a very large act of disobedience against God. You see, giving your sons circumcision, this might get a little, I'm going to do the best I can with this, but, but giving your sons circumcision was one of the basic covenant signs of God's people. To not do it was considered disobedience. And you get a sense for just how serious God takes this uh, when he looks at it. He said that the the one person said the blood of the covenant sign is what expresses the covenant promises to the covenant people. And this story is telling us in a, in a really mind-bending way is that God chose a man who wasn't even faithful to the covenant sign itself to be the bearer of the covenant promises of God to the covenant people of God. And so you're seeing two things that feel like they they contradict each other in mind-bending ways. First of all, you're getting a sense for just how serious God takes covenant faithfulness. And he said it over and over again in the story up till now. I am the God of your forefathers and the the covenant promises I gave to them, uh, I give to you. God is faithful to the covenant, and his expectation with seriousness is that Moses and the people would also be faithful to the covenant. But you're also seeing profound grace at the same time, because Moses is actually protected in faith. Some people uh, have speculated that Moses did not do the circumcision. Like, why would Moses not have circumcised his son? Some people have speculated that it was because Moses was married to Zipporah. And Zipporah was a Midianite. And maybe that was a source of conflict in their marriage. And uh, that's possible. It's not anywhere in the story. And it doesn't hold up to me. In fact, that's really a, a convenient way of passing the buck. As if it's not Moses' fault. Moses is the one that's being disciplined in this story. It was his failure, not Zipporah's. And and, and what's interesting is that Zipporah is the one that knew what to do. It was her faith that protected him. Her faith told her what needed to be done. She stepped in and she did it and she protected, she saved her husband's life. And not for nothing, but this is now the sixth woman in Moses' story where his life where, that saved Moses' life. You could write uh, 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 many chapters of, of Moses' biography just talking about the women that stepped in and saved his life. Six women, two of them foreigners. And we need to see this because we need to remember that Moses is not the redeemer of God's people. But even in this small scene... He is pointing to someone who is. Even then, he is pointing to someone he is. Look look at how Moses' life is protected. It wasn't when the son was circumcised. It was when he was touched by the blood of the circumcision. He was touched by the blood of the covenant sign. The blood of the covenant sign is when he was healed. This is a precursor to the sacrificial system. When, when uh, uh, animals, perfect spotless animals would, uh, would be sacrificed and uh, an, an association with their blood was given and we understood our forgiven state, states or the atonement of our sins. Hebrews 9 tells us that even then it's true just, just as, uh, uh, as it is now that Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And we are seeing that Moses is as much in need of these covenant promises as you and I are. And even then, even in this story, God is already using the story to point to one who will come. And who will shed his blood for the salvation of his covenant people. Can you see the parallels here? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us that we were ransomed from our disobedience. 
Except he didn't call it that. He called it the foolish ways of our forefathers. Not by perishable things, but by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. It's at the cross where we see the the wild combination of the seriousness of our sin and the generosity of God's grace all at the same time. You see, it's at the cross where we look and our hearts break because you can't look at the cross and see an innocent man suffering for my sins and not see our sins as serious, serious violations of the covenant relationship that we have with our Lord. It's at the cross where our hearts break. And it's at the cross where our hearts are healed. Because we're seeing a loving Savior standing in the way. Taking the penalty for our sin that we deserve. Listen, just as Moses was healed by the blood of something that was substituted for his punishment. So you and I are healed by the blood that was shed as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sin. And so we look at the cross and we see the profound seriousness of our need and we see the generosity of a Savior who meets every one of our needs. If you are wondering, the greatest, most fog-inducing question of all. Does God really love me? I want to ask you, have you beheld the cross for yourself lately? Have you looked at it in all of its terror and in all of its glory? Have you looked at the cross? One of my friends put it this way, When Jesus died, he hung between heaven and earth. And when they drove those nails into his hands and in his feet so that he bore our sins and carried them away, the nail print they left spelled your name. When you look at the cross, you see a Savior looking back at you saying, I did it for this one. I did it for her. And I did it for him. I did it because I love them. And I will always be with them. I did it so that I could protect them. See, by our faith in Jesus, we are united to Jesus. We are united to him in his death. And we're united to him in uh, in his resurrection. And so we are protected in faith. and, And he gives us all the reasons that we have to look forward encouraged in our faith. That's exactly what we see here in this passage. I mean, think about how, must, how, how encouraging it must have been for Moses to, to reunite with his brother that he hadn't seen in 40 years. Uh, in the wilderness, before he even crosses the border to go into Egypt, God arranged for Aaron to come out and meet him in the wilderness. And you see by the story, they, they, uh, they embraced uh, one brother, kisses the other brother, I mean, think about how encouraging that must have been. It's a reminder to him that God is providing for Moses along the way. And then think how encouraging it must have been for Moses and Aaron to go into Egypt together and and somehow all the people are gathered and and things go exactly the way God said they would go. Moses does all the signs and Aaron says all the things and it says all the people believed. And how encouraging it must have been for God's people as they're gathering up and hearing about how God has known about their suffering and has come amongst them and inspected their suffering and was already preparing a salvation to come. And so the response to them must have been, the response is overwhelming. It says they believed, they bowed their heads, and they worshiped. They believed They bowed their heads and they worshipped in anticipation of the salvation that was coming to them. I heard a story not too long ago. There's another friend of mine, he's a pastor, told this story. And I'm passing it along to you. 
was 19, 19, sometime in the 1980s, I think it was 1986, there was a terrible drought. It was a terrible drought in South Carolina, and uh, uh, a lot of people were suffering, and uh, so much so that a pastor, PCA pastor in town, not me, I was seven, uh, but P PCA pastor in town gathered as many as he could up, and he said, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for rain. And uh, the, the local newspaper uh, heard about it, and they came and saw all these people praying for rain, and there, were, there was a picture of the pastor standing there with a Bible in one hand and an umbrella in the other. And what was he doing? He was training them to anticipate. He was teaching them to anticipate that there is coming a time when God delivers good things to his people, things that his people need. And he was teaching them that when it comes, it's God's gift. You and I, listen, we are umbrella people. Uh, we live with the expectation that God is providing for us, even, even in ways that we don't understand, uh, both now and in the future. Just, just, uh, just as we can look back at what has happened uh, that Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross and he rose again and lives right now. We look forward to a time when the one who came will come again. We are umbrella people. Uh, we anticipate the goodness that God is sending to us in the future salvation. And so we do together right now what these people in this story are doing. We, we come together as God's covenant people and re we remind each other what we believe. And we bow, we bow before the Lord and we worship together. And we hold up a picture of what it's going to look like when Jesus comes back to renew all things. You know, it wasn't two months before Florence Chadwick tried to make that run again. Uh, and, uh, and she made it, she actually... Um, she made it in less than 14 hours. I think it was 13 hours, 50 minutes. Two months later, she turned around and tried it again. And uh, she did it in the exact same fog that was there last time. And the big difference was she, she said, she shared later she, that she implanted in her mind an image of the Catalina Island coastland. And I don't know how she did it. She might have, I, I wonder maybe if she got on a boat and just stared at the coastline for a while. Or if uh, she took a picture of it and looked at it every day. But she put in her head a familiarity with that coastline. So that even in the fog, she knew what was coming. With every stroke, she was familiar. She reminded herself over and over and over again of what that looked like. And that's what we do too. Uh, we remind ourselves of the one who came and will come again. And we look at the picture of Jesus coming back to meet us in the air and begin to renew all things. Do you have that image in your head? Can you see it? Let me pray. Oh, Father, teach us again of what it looks like to lean forward in faith uh, even in the difficulty, um, even in the questions that we have, I pray that you would show us what it means uh, to follow you faithfully as your people. Would you build us in faith as we hear from your word and as we sing back to you and then as we come to your table. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to our Lord God. It is good and right to do so. With joy, we praise you, gracious God, joining our voices with all these saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Let us proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Thank you. You can be seated. If you're helping to serve communion this morning, will you come forward uh, and attend to your places? If you're new with us, we come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. And there's three stations, one over there by those speakers, one here in the middle with Matt and myself, and one table over there at the foot of those steps. And so just go to the one that's uh, easiest for you to go to, but please do be mindful of the lines that form. And if it's getting a little long in one line, just slide over to the next one if you can. Uh, we also enjoy the practice of uh, saying prayers over many people that uh, come forward that aren't yet receiving the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you haven't made a profession of faith or haven't been baptized or haven't yet come to your own understanding or relationship with Jesus, then, uh, then come forward and ask the elder who serves the wine uh, to say a prayer over you. We would love to do that. Uh, here, what we're looking at is, uh, is a covenant meal that's given to God's people. Uh, it teaches us to remember what has been done, that a sacrifice has been made uh, that secures for us a, a future peace, with the, Lord, with the Lord Jesus himself, and it teaches us to look forward with hope that Jesus is indeed coming, and there will be a marriage supper of the Lamb, and it trains us in the encouragement to continue forward. It feeds us. This is food, true comfort food for the journey. And so if this is your faith, if you look with G to Jesus with eyes of faith, trusting him and him alone, and his sacrifice on your behalf, uh, then Jesus looks back at you with eyes of love and says, come eat and drink what I have provided for you. Uh, if this is not your faith, I can't tell you how happy we are that you would be with us. But if you're wrestling at all or not sure where you stand uh, with the claims of Christ, then we would ask you to refrain from taking from this meal. Let me, let me pray and then we'll eat and drink together. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray uh, that in your mercy you would be among us as our peace, feeding your people. Uh, with this bread and this wine? Would you do with these ordinary elements uh, the extraordinary work that only you can do in building your saints for our growth and grace? Deepen us in faith, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, and after he had given thanks for it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he also took the cup and he poured it out for his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. And the Apostle Paul tells us that every time we eat this bread and every time we drink from this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes back. And so all those who bear the name of Christ with grateful hearts, come, eat and drink, taste and see that the Lord is good. There is 
We'll stand and we'll pray the prayer after communion together. Renewed now with heavenly bread, by which faith is nourished, hope increased, and love strengthened. We pray, O Lord, that we might hunger for Christ, the true and living bread, and strive to live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
extend your hands. Receive the Lord's blessing. May the love of Jesus, sorry, may the grace of Jesus and the love of the Father and the fellowship that is yours through his Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. May you go in peace.